Why is altitude training not making us faster cyclists? Welcome to the Science of Getting Faster podcast, where we cut through the headlines, talk directly to the researchers to find out what their studies suggest, what they don't, and where their research is heading. With us on the podcast today, we have Dr. Benjamin Levine and nurse practitioner Shannon Gri- Grapp. Sorry, what is that again? Grappy. Grapp. Grapp. <laughs> no, you literally did all the ones I said. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I've been anxious about this name for a while. Um, so nurse practitioner Shannon Grupp. Um, Dr. Benjamin Levine is the founder and director of the Institute for Exercise and Environmental Medicine at Texas Health Presbyterian Hospital in Dallas. Nurse practitioner Shannon Grapp directly works directly with athletes at the Institute for Exercise and Environmental Medicine. Welcome to the podcast, guys. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks for coming on. So today we're going to be discussing how our iron levels can limit the blood for the red blood cell formation um, in response to altitude. Could you start by explaining how altitude is proposed to improve endurance performance? Sure. Well, when you go up to high altitude, there's less atmospheric pressure, and therefore the pressure of oxygen becomes less. The partial, the uh, so when you, for example, if you were to go up to eighteen thousand feet to the summit of Mount Kilimanjaro, there's only half as much oxygen available in the air as there is at sea level, and so so the human body has a number of different ways to respond to low levels of oxygen. Probably the one that's most important for competitive athletes is that you increase the amount of erythropoietin, which is a potent hormone produced in the kidneys, and that causes the bone marrow to produce new red blood cells. So it enhances the amount of blood in your circulation and increases the amount of oxygen that can be carried to your skeletal muscle. So that, that is the essence of why altitude exposure and altitude training is, is likely to be beneficial. Now, here's the problem. Because there's less oxygen around, uh, you can't train as hard. And um, most good athletes retain competitive performance by doing high-quality work, which requires high rates of oxygen flux. So for many years, athletes have gone to high altitude, but it's been very difficult to prove that they actually get better when they come down to sea level because the gain in uh, red blood cells and oxygen uh, transport capacity is offset by a relative detraining that occurs when athletes have to try to train, train hard in a low oxygen environment. So in the early 90s, uh, my good friend and colleague, Jim Stray-Gunderson, who unfortunately passed away this past fall, um, and I came up with a a unique idea. We said, what if you could get the best of both worlds? What if you could live at altitude and acquire all those acclimatization responses that improve the ability to exercise, but travel down Mm -hmm. every day? to closer to sea level so you could train hard. And that was called the living high training low model, which is now the most widely adopted model for altitude training around the world. Yeah. And does this, the live high train low model, does that consistently, do you see consistent results with that? So like any um, athletic intervention, there's a large amount of individual variability, of course. And uh, it turns out that a lo- one of the major uh, components of that variability is this erythropoietic response. Now, let me just say before we dive into that, that there are a few sort of common things that most athletes know, but if you don't take care of them, you can't really determine the effect of altitude. So the first is you have to be well-trained to begin with. There's no magic to altitude. So athletes need to be well-trained. They have to have good nutrition. They have to be uh, at the right point in their macro cycle and ready for an enhanced uh, training um, uh, sessions and training camp. And all those so things have to be optimized. What um, point in your macro cycle would you suggest that altitude is 
um, the most beneficial? <clears throat> so, so there are. It depends on what your goal of that part of your macro cycle is. So, for example, some athletes and coaches use it during the base buildup phase to increase their aerobic power. Um, some athletes use it to get that just little boost before a competition. So it really can be used in multiple different ways. Some athletes and coaches use it so that when they come back down to sea level, they can get a really good few weeks of hard training in preparation for the next phase. So I think as long as you're asking what the goal of your training camp is, then you can get the best effect of altitude. But um, what we found, Rob Chapman, who is one of a, my postdoctoral fellows and is now the director of sports science for USA Track and Field. <clears throat> Rob Chapman did a very interesting study. He asked, um, out of all the patients that we, all the patients, he asked out of all the athletes who have done altitude training in our studies. <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. Rob asked out of all the patients, out of, Rob asked, out of all the athletes who have done altitude training uh, in our studies, um, what were the factors that determined who was going to get faster when they came back down to sea level? The one other thing I needed to add that I did mention before was, if you go to altitude, you have to go there long enough and you have to live high enough to develop the optimal acclimatization response. So for, as a simple thought experiment, if you go up for an hour and just sit around and come back down to sea level, you won't get any acclimatization response at all. And we've learned over the years, because of the ability to create artificial altitude environments, that you have to stay in the altitude environment for at least 12 to 16 hours a day. And you need to do it for at least three to four weeks to really start to get the maximal benefit. So let's assume that all those things are equal and all the athletes are doing the same thing. Then the athletes who have the biggest increase in erythropoietin are the ones who have the biggest increase in red cell mass the ones who have the biggest increase in VO2 max, the maximal oxygen uptake, and they're the ones who get faster. So that was good, solid evidence for us that this erythropoietic response, the ability to increase the amount of red blood cells in your body, was really the most important factor. Now, our colleagues in Australia, um, Laura Garvikin, now Lewis, um, did some really interesting studies where they used an artificial environment and stayed in there for 16 hours a day. And what they did was every week or so, they pulled some blood out. So they measured how much blood the blood was expanding. And each couple of weeks, they pulled the blood out. And so there was no increase in hemoglobin mass. And for those athletes, and they did this in a placebo-controlled fashion, so the athletes didn't know what was happening. For those who had the blood pulled out, they didn't get increased their VO2 max, and they didn't get faster. So really very hard scientific evidence that it's the erythropoietic response that is the dominant factor. Did that answer your question? Yeah, definitely. So then what are the characteristics that determine whether we're going to get an erythropoietic Now I'm going to butcher this word, I can never get it right, but erythropoietic it's not poetic, but we'll move on in <laughs> response. What's the, what determines whether an athlete um, can get those adaptations? So <clears throat> some of it is likely to be genetic. That is, some athletes will have a bigger bump than others. And that variation may be quite wide. When we studied it under very carefully controlled conditions in an altitude chamber, for example, we've shown that athletes may have a 400% increase in EPO or a 40% decrease after 24 hours at 3,000 meters or about nine or 10,000 feet. So there's a huge individual variability in this response. That probably relates to the absolute altitude, and each individual may have a threshold where if they don't respond to, say, 
6,000 feet or 1,800 meters, maybe they'll respond to seven or eight or nine. We don't really know that. We know that the majority of athletes will respond to 8,000 feet or 2,500 meters. And that's probably the sweet spot. If you go too low, you may not get in the majority of athletes a good erythropoietic response. And if you go too high, you may confound the the um, training response by poor sleep, by altitude illness, by other negative aspects of being in a high altitude environment. So there is kind of a sweet spot. It's in that 2,000 to 2,500 meter range where most good altitude training camps can take place. So there is a genetic factor for sure. Um, there are other factors though that are important. For example, if an athlete tries to go with a bad infection or inflammation, that suppresses the erythropoietic response. And there's really no point in doing that. Um, so the athlete has to be well. And then I think one of the issues that you want to talk about in this podcast is you have to have adequate iron stores. You've got to have iron in the bone marrow and in the liver because iron is one of the most important critical components of building red blood cells. Not just red blood cells also, it's mitochondrial cytochromes and, and myoglobin, other heme-containing proteins that are important in the transfer of oxygen from the environment down to the muscle. Why would iron have a bigger role in at altitude as opposed to sea level? Well, um, that's because at altitude, there's much more pressure to build red blood cells. So at sea level, you know, we have a pretty uh, regular rate of iron turnover, about a milligram per day in a non-athlete, maybe two milligrams of iron per day in an athlete. So that just by itself is important. Athletes need twice as much iron as non-athletes, even at sea level. That increase is probably fourfold when you go to high altitude. So the iron requirements to respond to this low oxygen environment, to build the red blood cells, to increase the myoglobin, to increase the cytochromes, go up a lot. Um, so, so altitude puts additional pressure on the entire iron erythropoietic pathway. Okay. And so I've heard of iron insufficiency. And mm -hmm. then is there iron insufficiency or deficiency anemia as well? Well, th that simply reflects a graded amount of iron deficiency, right? So you can have inadequate iron stores without being frankly anemic. And for us in the practitioner world, this is the biggest problem we run into. So a doctor may draw a, a, a CBC, a complete blood count, and measure the hemoglobin or the hematocrit and say, oh, you're not anemic, you're fine. When in fact that hemoglobin should be 20 or 30 or 40 percent higher just because it's within the normal range. And when we measure the ferritin, which is the best measure of iron stores, it can be exceedingly low. So, so of course, if you have very low iron, if you've lost a lot of iron or you're not taking enough iron in consistently over a long period of time, you can be iron deficient enough but you can't make the red blood cells and you can become frankly anemic. And that's called iron deficiency anemia. Got it. Is this a bigger concern for endurance athletes as opposed to say um, a soccer player or other um, non-endurance sports? Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm not sure the soccer players would be happy if you told them they weren't endurance athletes. So, you know, <laughs> I, I think soccer players have to sustain running and have multiple recovery efforts from faster sprints. You know, as you know, as an endurance athlete yourself, you don't just run around the track or the cross country course at one speed, right? You ebb and flow, you have to accelerate and recover. So I think there's a lot of similarities. Let's say a strength, pure strength athlete, like a weightlifter or a shot putter. Well, their activity really doesn't depend on oxygen transport at all. They could do this, you know, at the summit of Mount Everest, and they'd actually do better. Uh, we we know this from the Mexico City Olympics, which were held at twenty three hundred meters in Mexico City. The some of the 
the records that were sent in the shorter distances, 100 meters, 200, 400, were not broken for 30 years afterwards because there's less air resistance and they could run faster and didn't really need oxygen transport to begin with. So I think endurance athletes uh, and the longer the duration of the activity, the more it's dependent on oxygen and oxygen transport. So 400 to 800 meters for a runner is about that distance. Once you start getting to 1,500, 5,000, 10,000 marathon, then the oxygen becomes critically important. And the less um, uh, oxygen there is or the less blood you have to transport, the less effective you'll be and the more effective blood doping will be. Yeah, definitely. The reason I say soccer is that I used to be a soccer player. And when Mm. I started running, I then became anemic. And I'm not totally sure. Is that, do you think that has something to do with the duration then? Or perhaps it was um, energy available, like just not consuming? So I think there's, yeah, there's a good, it's a good question, Sarah. And without knowing your particular details, it's hard to know. But I can think of a number of reasons why that might be. Number one, I guess your training volume went up a lot when you became an endurance runner compared to a soccer player where a lot of the training is sprints and it's technical training. Whereas endurance, you you may, I don't know, maybe you got up to 60 miles a week if you're a good endurance athlete. That takes a lot of time. The other thing running high intensity exercise does is it raises hepcidin levels. So that reduces the amount of iron absorption. Then, of course, there's the constant battle that endurance runners, particularly women, have, which is with their body weight. And there's constant pressure to not eat. I don't know if you suffer from that with your coaches at all. Nobody complains at a soccer player that you're too fat. But how many women have been you know, abused by their coaches, particularly distance runners, and told you're too fat, you need to lose weight? How did they do that? By starving themselves. They reduce mm-hmm. energy intake. And uh, yeah, so I, I think that there are multiple reasons why endurance athletes and, are more susceptible. And in our, in our studies, we, we saw about two-thirds of American distance runners were frankly iron insufficient. And up, up to 35 or 40% of the men too. So it's not just women. You also lose iron and sweat, of course. Um, when you slough off skin, it's in your skin. So if you get out there and you're getting sunburned and you're losing skin, you know, there's a lot of different ways to lose that iron. Wow. Okay. What about um, between the different, um, so say a cyclist versus a runner versus a swimmer, um, is there one that's more likely to, or more susceptible to um, becoming iron deficient? Sure. Well, you know, we we haven't done as comprehensive a survey of cyclists and swimmers, but again, uh, we have not found the rate as high in rowers, swimmers, cyclists, as we do in runners. And I guess that's because the body weight makes such a big difference, yet they still need to sustain such a high rate of energy output. So it's hard to keep it up. I mean, and uh, that that being said, of course, altitude exposure and altitude training remains very important for swimming and for cycling, probably more for cycling than swimming, since swimming is so dependent on technique. And that's what distinguishes the great swimmers from the not so great swimmers. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so we've got a good understanding of who is susceptible um, to iron insufficiency and what impact that can have then on our adaptations to altitude. So how do we rectify it? Or first of all, I suppose it would be uh, measuring it would be the first step, right? Absolutely. And I think that every single uh, female distance runner, um, frankly, should have their their uh, ferritin as well as their hemoglobin measured. I think um, every uh, athlete prior to altitude exposure, all vegetarian athletes, and all endurance athletes who are having deteriorating performance. Uh, I think that should be part of the standard evaluation um, of 
uh, endurance athletes. What are, you said that sometimes you'll go to the doctor and they tell you that you're within a normal range. What's the optimal range for an athlete, an endurance athlete? Are, are you asking me about hemoglobin or are you asking me about ferritin? Sorry, ferritin. But you should tell us both. That would be helpful. Right. So hemoglobin concentration is, is or hematocrit is dependent not just on the number of red blood cells, but the amount of plasma volume. And so the, the, I would say that there is no perfect or optimal hemoglobin or hematocrit. Most individuals keep within a range of 40 to 50 percent red blood cells. Um, that's the hematocrit. You know, uh, it's a little bit of a complex question because, as you probably know, most athletes, endurance athletes, now have a blood passport. Because it, individuals have very different hemoglobin and hematocrits, it's easy to cheat and to modify. Let's say your natural hemoglobin is uh, 14 and you inject EPO under the skin to get it to 17. Well, that's still going to be normal, but it's not normal for you. And so one of the things that uh, Jim Stray Gunnarsson and others developed um, was called the SAFE program, which is designed and really established that whole process of checking hemoglobin, hematocrit, erythropoietin levels over the course of a season to make sure that they're staying reasonably stable. Ferritin's a little easier. Our goal is to have it somewhere, I think, ideally between 50 and 100. So okay. that would be ideal. Uh, I would consider less than 10 to be severely iron deficient, 10 to 20 to be moderate to severe iron deficient, 20 to 50 is uh, closer for women, maybe still be on the low side for men, and greater than 50 should be the goal. Why do we see those differences between men and women? Well, one obvious reason is that young women bleed once a month. So they have a, a, a regular um, uh, mechanism for losing blood. That's sort of the obvious one. A regular um, loss of blood, women also are more susceptible to uh, the um, energy deficiency syndrome, um, where because they're so dependent and the coaches focus so much on their body weight. But, but I think, you know, losing blood once a month is a good reason for women to be more susceptible than men. Would it be worth them trying to um, match those levels that are um, deemed as optimal in men through supplementation, or is it simply just not possible due to the? No, it's uh, possible. Okay. No, it's possible, and and I think you know a regular iron intake is essential for women. Vegetarians, you, you know, about I don't know about. Uh, 20% or so of your of the diet comes from heme. Um, so animal products, you know, uh, there it's called heme iron, comes from animal products. Uh, it's really well absorbed, it turns out, better than non-heme iron, which is the stuff that's found in grains, cereals, vegetables, uh, as well as animal tissues. That's most of the absorbed iron comes from that sources. So but vegetarians, you know, are on the weaker side of that. And um, uh, I think all athletes, endurance athletes, should supplement with some degree of iron. But that's where checking the ferritin comes in and why that's so important. Okay. So when we come to supplementation then, so we've um, measured the baseline um, prior to an athlete going up to altitude, what is the strategy then to get them back to a level that is um, worthwhile um, for their time to go up to altitude? Sure. And, and remember, it's also important that when they go to altitude, they have to increase their iron intake by at least a factor of four. So, so just the, doing the same thing they did at sea level, they will become iron deficient when they're at altitude. So that's why it's so important to check right away. 
you know, there are multiple different ways to do this. And I'd like to, to, to first of all, emphasize where it is most important and then let Shannon jump in and help you chat a little bit about how to do this for your athletes. So the proposal that we've made to USA Track and Field is that if the ferritin is less than 10 and there's a performance impairment, I almost call that a iron emergency, right? Those athletes need a rapid increase in their iron. And the only way to really do that is with IV iron, if there are no contraindications. Um, if the ferritin is less than 10 and performance is adequate, then I still prefer IV iron, though oral iron can be used with very careful follow-up. And can, Shannon can talk to you about the, the, the fact that hepcidin levels, hepcidin is what governs the absorption of iron because you can get into trouble with too much iron. You know, there are iron that can be very toxic. So the body is really good at modulating iron levels and preventing them from getting too high. When the iron levels get too high, hepcidin goes up and prevents iron from being absorbed. When you go up to altitude or iron gets low, hepcidin gets low and you can then increase its absorption. But if you take it every day or twice a day, you simply blunt the you you, um, you raise hepcidin levels and you stop absorbing the iron. So taking it every, twice a day doesn't really help. Taking it every day probably is not ideal, though you may need to do that to get the amounts of oral iron in that you need. Okay. Um, so so let me let me just finish this one session and then I'm going to turn you over to Shannon while I run down and see a patient. Okay. So um, if the ferritin is between 10 and 20 and there is performance enhance impairment, I still think I IV iron is the way to go. Oral iron is potentially acceptable with very careful follow-up. If the ferritin is over 20 to 50 or over 50, then routine iron should be the standard three times a week in the morning. Um, and then if the ferritin is greater than 50, all you probably have to do is add iron supplementation when you go to high altitude. Now, IV iron is has become much very popular in the clinical arena and much easier and safer to use. So this is where Shannon is, you know, the world's expert. And I'm going to turn you over to her. So Shannon... So you're working with the athletes directly to administer the IV. How often would, so how, first of all, how does an athlete get referred to you? Sure. So athletes can self-refer um, themselves. We like to have at least a physician that is going to monitor them more consistently. So you kind of think of us like, um, like your specialty side coach that's going to kind of help you intermittently as needed for the special things. But you need to, of course, have someone who monitors you more routinely for other things. Um, so that physician, so coaches, uh, we, we do work with a lot of universities and, and coaches, so they can be referred in a lot of different ways. Or if you're kind of out there doing your own thing, um, trying to make it work on your own, you can always reach out. And we can um, we can help that way as well. Yeah. And where is it that you're based? We're in Dallas, Dallas, Dallas. Texas. Yes. Yeah. So is this something that's common throughout the U.S. or is it like where um, is it, it accessible to lots of athletes to get IV iron or is it um, something that's quite unique to your clinic? So I would say that administering IV iron is very common. Um, we typically just don't see it as much outside of um, like dialysis or places like the hematology office, places where people have blood disorders, kind of those more um, obvious reasons you might need to replace iron. So if you have you know a cancer diagnosis or you have some type of blood disorder or you're, you're, you have a kidney disease that would need you have you um doing dialysis those are times where it's in my in my field those are really obvious moments where you're going to need to replace iron i would say that when i 
started working with Dr. Levine, it became so much more obvious to me that that is not something that is that is monitored or really thought about very often, kind of in your healthy population. So um, I guess it's unique in, to this office in that way, but the, the ability to get iron it is it, in the IV format is not is not rare or obscure. There are a lot of infusion centers and there's a lot of access if you know how to, if you know how to get it. Okay. Yeah. So for our athletes who don't necessarily have a personal coach or referring them, they've probably got their primary care doctor. Mm -hmm. Um, how would you recommend, so if they're not, um, in need of IV iron, Mm -hmm. um, but they are going to supplement with, they need to supplement to get to those, um, to that range that Dr. Levine spoke of, what's mm-hmm. what's the best protocol for um, getting your iron levels up to that level? Sure, sure. And I, you may give me the opportunity to say this. I think there are a few things when you think about levels um, that you have to kind of factor in on things that might hinder your ability to get those levels in the oral format. So maybe we'll circle back around to that. But to answer your question, Um, Like Dr. Levine said, you don't, if you are taking in a lot of iron, your, your, your body regulates that with the hepcidin. So the kind of idea is enough, but not too much that your body reacts to that. So that's where, in a way that stops it. I think of hepcidin like the lock on the door. So we want people to come over so that we can visit with them, but we don't want them to come over all the time. So hepcidin is kind of that lock that keeps that that flow the way we want it. Um, and I think about that in that way when I think about taking in iron. So if you have, you know, an enormous amount of iron that you're taking in, hepcidin is going to step in and go, ooh, that's too much. Let me slow that down. So you have to think okay. about. So it's best take, then to work. Sorry. No, go ahead. No, no, that's it's best to kind of regulate that. So a lot of times my athletes are always very ambitious about their goals and then they are very ambitious about everything that they do. So we talk about a a lot is not as good as just doing it correctly. So that is what Dr. Levine was talking about as far as taking it in at certain times and at a certain frequency. So we actually see better replacement and your body take it in more efficiently and use it if you're taking the your iron um, in the morning on an empty stomach every other day versus, and we can get into why, but why you would want to take it on an empty stomach versus whenever you think about taking it and taking it multiple times a day or, you know, multiple days during the week, that is when you, that's probably the best way. But if you're very iron deficient, of course, we need to give you more throughout the day. And that kind of changes the way that you think about it. Um, trying to supplement. But as a general rule, on an empty stomach, first thing in the morning, every other day is a good way to think about taking an oral supplement. Now, the problem with that is that iron is typically not very well tolerated. So it can have a lot of like upset stomach, you can get nauseated. I don't know about other people, but my stomach first thing in the morning is not looking for anything like that. And so it can be upsetting. Um, there are a couple of formulations that I've found that people tolerate much better. And so I try to start with those. Um, it's also very important that you take your that supplement with vitamin C. And that can be, you know, as much as just a serving of orange juice or um, or a, a vitamin C tablet or some of those formulations come with vitamin C. And but you see a tremendous 60, 70 percent increase in that absorption if it's taken with iron. I think that answers your question. Definitely. Yeah, that's super helpful. So the amount then that you, so if it's as long as you're not, as you say, like in an iron emergency, Mm -hmm. um, taking it every second morning, how much would you recommend someone start with? Sure. So whenever you're just trying to kind of keep, keep it managed and keep it, you know, just supplement, you're not in an emergency, like you said, then you just do the typical, it's 365 milligrams. It's confusing on the package because it'll say 365 milligrams or 65 milligrams of elemental iron. 
So those are the two numbers that you're looking for, but that's pretty much any over-the-counter iron formulation is that's typically how it's it's presented to you. To get more than that is there's an effort involved to find a formulation outside that. So pretty much if you pick up an over-the-counter supplement, that's the dosage that it's going to come in. And you only re- really need one of those every other morning with vitamin C. You mentioned that there's some limitations um, to absorption. Mm-hmm. What are what should we avoid doing to prevent limiting that absorption? Right. So whenever think about starting your day and you start to put foods in, everything has some amount of iron in it. And so it interacts with that hepcidin. And so what you're trying to do is as you're as you go through the day, normally your hepcidin levels kind of ebb and flow and increase through the day. So Hepcidin is the lock that keeps iron from coming in and going. So what you don't want to do is take your iron at the end of the day when your hepcidin levels are naturally a bit higher. And then therefore you have less ability to metabolize it and, and pull it in and use it. So that's why we try to do it at the beginning of the day, which is obviously that it makes it hard because most people don't tolerate it well first thing in the morning on an empty stomach. They tolerate it better at the end of the day when they've had you know food and things are all a little bit more happy to take in something like iron. You don't get so much um, upset stomach and nausea and things like that. It's just not as well absorbed. Um, There are, you know, certain foods and supplements that obviously can interact with it, but I would think that that is the most obvious reason that that could decrease the efficacy of, of taking it. Yeah, definitely. And you mentioned that you have some formulations that you think or your experience has told you that they work better with athletes. What are those? So I'm not sponsored by anyone. I just have kind of gone through um, Vitron C seems to be really well tolerated by most everyone. And I don't understand if it's their formulation or what it is, but it has the vitamin C in it as well. So it's one less thing to think about. So I find that that one works really well. Um, And then any kind of more like enteric coated formulation that can just kind of not start absorbing as soon as it hits your stomach and it allows it to get into the intestinal tract a little bit better. Um, But I, you know, plug for Vitron C, but that that's the one that seems to be really well tolerated for most people. Okay. And um, Dr. Levine mentioned that um, if when like women have their natural menstrual cycle Mm -hmm. and so that causes some um, blood loss and therefore a reduction in iron, do you adjust the dose um, during that time or do you just kind of keep it consistent um, in the hope that it evens out? Yeah, I'm really happy that you asked that question because one thing that I don't think we talk about enough as females and especially in the athletic community is your your menstrual cycle. So if you are having um, certain things that, that go on during your menstrual cycle, it really doesn't matter how much iron you're taking in if you're losing too much blood on the back end, right? So things that are really important to convey to your health your healthcare provider would would be, um, you know, how long it is in between your periods and how much, how long those periods are. So if it's more than seven days, that's that's significant. If you have a lot of bleeding or you're going through, you know, more than one pad or tampon in an hour, these are significant things that can really affect the way that um, you're able to to manage your your iron level, your ferritin level, and, and of course, the way that you can replace it. So There's a lot of things that you need to think about whenever you're talking specifically to menstruating females um, and athletes specifically. Well, I'm glad that I uh, I was not there for all this discussion. It sounds like I came in <laughs> just at the right time. Yeah, we got a good um, the expert on that. So um, thank you. I think that's all my questions. But what um, what would you, both of your advice with regards to um, iron and altitude? What's the key takeaways that you'd like to um, leave our listeners with? So I think the key takeaways is every athlete, every female athlete and every athlete going to altitude for altitude training camp needs to have their ferret checked. 
There's no point in going to spending all the time and resources to go to altitude if you're iron deficient and won't respond. Our data are very compelling about that. Um, uh, athletes who are iron deficient before they go don't respond well. So then depending on how low your ferritin is, you need to replace it before you go to altitude. And then you need to increase your iron intake while you're at altitude to support that acclimatization response. I'm okay. a big fan of IV iron. I'm sure you now, every, all your listeners know how to get that. And um, uh, I, I really have stopped using oral iron. You know, we, we, um, all, most of these studies were done before the discovery of hepcidin. And so we really didn't realize how challenging it is to replace with oral iron. I mean, we gave huge doses of liquid iron. Um, and now we know why even with those doses, it took a long time to get it back up. So IV iron is now safe. Uh, it can be done easily and reasonably cheaply. And for elite athletes, for sure, I, I would probably just go ahead and replace it with IV iron. Okay. Um, actually, I have a question on the back of that. Um, people who are generally going to altitude for these altitude camps, they plan them in advance. And so to find out that you are low in iron, I'm sure is a little bit inconvenient. How much time can you expect um, to return to levels that are uh, appropriate to send your athlete to altitude? So with IV iron, instantaneously. So check okay. it a month beforehand. Make sure that you've got a healthcare provider who knows what they're doing and is willing to provide IV iron if necessary. And it's it's instantaneous restoration with IV iron. That's the advantage of it. You don't have to worry about okay. absorption, about GI side effects, about all the things that make it difficult to give orally. Great. Um, Shannon, is there anything else that you'd like to leave us with? Add into that? Um, you know, I feel like on the kind of the back of what Dr. Ween just said, thinking about hepcidin, um, of course, lots of people have different, you know, GI inflammatory things that are occurring even athletes do, or if you have any kind of systemic inflammation that's occurring in some capacity, it drives up your hepcidin. So some of the, the research that I've read also, um, you know, if you're taking an oral iron and your hepcidin is high from something that you can't control um, very well, like an inflammatory process, that giving IV iron can actually be a little bit therapeutic in that way and you're able to replace it. So I think it's important to think about IV iron from a different perspective than I'm only trying to replace and fix the iron deficiency. And also it can help calm down some of those GI inflammatory disorders because you can replace the iron and decrease a little bit of that hepcidin that is in response to the iron deficiency, not the inflammatory process. So, and from a scientific standpoint, that's actually very interesting because <clears throat> the reason that, the, remember, all the iron has to come in through the gut, right? And the reason the gut is such a good modulator of iron is because it the inside of the gut is very hypoxic and, the, and very anaerobic. And so many of the inflammatory bowel conditions are now, we're now treating them with hyperbaric oxygen. Um, so increasing the oxygen availability reduces the inflammation in the gut. So, so it, it is a, um, a process that interacts with each other. Where can our athletes um, follow your work uh, where, if they want to um, keep up with what you're producing and um, the latest research? Well, the best thing for us is to go to our website. It's www.texashealth.org slash I-E-E-M. And that will uh, go over all the latest and greatest. We're doing some interesting studies related to oxygen utilization on the summit of Mount Everest. We're actually doing a hyperbaric oxygen for the treatment of chronic concussion. Um, and so we have a a, uh, a whole group studying muscle pain and muscle injury. A lot of things going on. A heat tolerance group, a group that that studies pregnancy and cardiovascular control in women. So uh, it's a very wow. large research program. And come visit us and uh, reach out if you have any questions. 
Definitely. We'll definitely keep tabs on that then. Thank you both so much for coming on. We really appreciate your time and I know that you're both very busy. Um, thanks. Nice to Thank meet you, you, Sarah. It was a pleasure. Thanks.